Welcome to season eight of a Vietnam podcast, sharing the stories of people connected to Vietnam. My name is Neil Mackay. I've been living in Vietnam since 2016 and hosting this podcast since 2019. I wanted to know more about the people that lived in Vietnam, both local and foreigners, and share their story. My guest today was born and raised in Hanoi, but left Vietnam at the age of just 18 to study business and interior design in Japan and worked for companies such as IKEA. He is a creative director, artist, and dog dad of Crumpet and Butter. We will share today what it was like leaving Vietnam at a young age and living in Japan, what it's like being a creative today, what actually is an NFT, and how he got his dog's Instagram to 140,000 followers. My guest today is Ben Nguyen. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. So, first of all, come on. Everyone loves dogs. I love dogs. Tell us all about Crumpet and Butter. Well, well thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Like, I've, I've never been on a podcast before. Ooh, um, podcast virgin. Awesome. Yeah, podcast virgin. Um, well, um, Crumpet is a corgi. Uh, she's five years old. Um, Butter is a chow chow, a white chow chow. It's quite rare in Vietnam. Um, she's uh, just turned three. We forgot her birthday, uh, like really bad parents, but um, yeah, um, super fluffy, super cute, uh, super well behaved. Um, uh, they they moved to from Japan to Vietnam with us, uh, two years ago and living their best life now. <laughs> you brought them from Japan, yeah. Are your dogs are they spoiled like mine? I think to some extent, yes, <laughs> like well, who doesn't spoil their dogs, right? <laughs> that is a good point. Well, because we've just come back from, you know, Phu Quoc and we, we made the effort to take Biscuit all the way to Phu Quoc for Tet. We took a car overnight. Then we went by ferry. Instead of just getting a 45-minute flight, you know, it was like an 11-hour journey, which is fine. And mm. then she gets to spend all the time on the beach. And because you mentioned that comment there, like living their best life. And it's just looking at her and you're like, you have a better life than most human beings. Yeah, absolutely. Like that, does she actually like it, or we just assume that they having the best life, but they actually hate the beach? <laughs> no, she loves it. And then now that we're back, back, she looks miserable. She just sits on the couch, like staring at us, like I want to go to the beach. Why are we sitting <laughs> in this apartment? You know. But so tell me then. So I think we have a, uh, an Instagram for Biscuit. Yeah, we do. Go check it out if you're listening. You want to follow Biscuit? It's Biscuit the Back Pig. I think there's about twenty followers on there. How did you get their Instagram account to 140,000 followers? That means they're dog influencers. Well, I mean, we, we can say that, but like, uh, <laughs> honestly, I, I, I did not know. Like, I started out um, just creating an, an account, and you know, like, who doesn't want to have an account for their dogs, right? And uh, at that time, I only had a crumpet, and um, we're just like sharing, you know, daily life pictures, videos, and just one night, uh, um, one page called Nine Gag, if you, if you know about it, it's just like one of the biggest, uh, you know, social media pages at that time, uh, reposted a video of Crumpet doing um, army crawl. So she was like, you know, like, because Corgi is already so short, uh, but she was doing the army crawl and we can't really tell if she's like standing or she's like crawling. So they reposted that and then it happened overnight. I was already sleeping. Um, the, mo the next morning it was like blowing up and my phone was like, you know, keeping getting notifications. I, I even didn't know that uh, which page reposted it. And then my friend told me like, oh my God, you were featured here. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And then it just happened that night and it was just like 10,000 followers over one night. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. It's amazing how that happens. We had Fook Map on the, the show before. I don't know if you know him. Yeah, He's yeah. The, the blogger, yeah. A uh, vlogger, sorry. And uh, his story's similar, you know. So he was making uh, his first or one of his first YouTube videos. I don't know if you know about it. When he walked around Saigon with his pet chicken, like quotation marks, pet chicken. And um, somebody took a picture of him and posted it. And it went viral like that night. So before he'd even made the video and published it, he was already like this viral sensation. It's crazy how it can happen so quickly. 
yeah it's crazy right so it's like like we don't know we just live our life and then just one day we'll, we'll be over all over the internet um and yeah now everyone loves him so much so do you get offers for them to be like influencers like wear this stuff promote these products come to our uh, opening <laughs> event with your dogs well um what seems like pet influencer is still like um a new thing in in japan and in vietnam so we don't really like monetize much of them um but we we still get like you know like free gifts uh you know like sponsor products and stuff to like help promote uh for the brands more like that than just like yeah. you know like uh and we uh luckily we 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 were lucky we got a um like a tv commercial no uh, way. For a brand in vietnam uh because we we know our one of our friends is the director and then uh crumpet was on that that's awesome. yeah <laughs> is there such a thing as a dog agent there must be even it must be in the us at least right uh, yeah i'm sure like there's still like agencies here who you know like who would like uh what do you call it acquire talent <laughs> and um I th- I think that, yeah, from Ben and Brother, I haven't uh, got their luck yet, but we'll we'll be there soon. I'm gonna work on it. I'm gonna work We're on gonna it. Get Bis- there. Biscuit's so lazy; she doesn't bring in any money. We have to feed her. She doesn't do anything. <laughs> she sleeps all day. I'm gonna get her out to work. Gonna get her to start making some money. I mean, that's the best life, right? Like actually, <laughs> from Ben and Brother are still having to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, so. Let's tell me all about you're from Hanoi originally. You're obviously in Saigon. Talked about it several times on this podcast. We've had people from Saigon and from Hanoi. Um, and it's something that we experienced a little bit just over um, Tet. We met lots of people from Hanoi. I know that they're very different. Do you want to, can you maybe explain what that means to you in terms of being from Hanoi till you were 18, then living overseas, then living in Saigon? How, did, how do you see those differences? Um... I actually I wanna ask back to you that like what different like what's the difference that you you are finding between us because for us it's just like you know like we uh we're, we're still Vietnamese so we we can tell each other by the accent and yeah. you know uh, a little bit of mannerism but for you guys like I'm actually curious like how do you like do you, can you tell them apart or so so I so I can't tell them apart I will I can a little bit like if I hear the accent. But in terms of mannerisms or personality, I can't tell the difference. But when I'm with my Vietnamese friends, then they tell me. So I, I'm sharing like a secondhand uh, opinion. Mm. But uh, but it's been it's been a repeated thing from different people that um, there's a big difference. So that, I want to know what your opinion is before I share what I've what I've been told. But again, it's all secondhand because I can't actually uh, understand what those those nuances are um how to how to talk about this without being so discriminating <laughs> if you know what i mean um <laughs> uh, no it's just like uh i think we um how to say it's 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 kind of um it's just all my first time actually living in the south so um it's just like you know uh every day learning new words actually for me like yeah. sometimes i like I have no idea what they're talking about, or just like it's like simple nouns to to tell uh, to talk about things uh, that I don't understand, and then actually misunderstood, and then give them a wrong thing. So it's just like little things like that. It's like really fun to like live here. Um, but other than that, I think uh, to me uh, the southern people are like because of their accent, they sound uh, sweeter to me. Okay. Well, they, they yeah. like they like sweeter food as well, don't they? Like, especially for the girls, like they they sound really cute. Like, like you know what I mean? Like, uh, like really gentle, really um, in a cute way. All oh, right. No, so I, yeah. no, I don't. I don't really know that one. Oh, interesting. That's a good one. Well, yeah. One of the things that my friend had told me there was that um, we talk. You talk kind of mentioned like discriminatory. So there's always the misconception that foreigners will always be ripped off, you know, given the, the foreigner price. But she told me that when she went to Hanoi or when she goes to Hanoi, they will rip off southerners faster and more than they would rip off a foreigner. Well, that, that's not, not true. Um, no, it's not true. 
uh, no, it's not not true. Like, oh, not it, not it, true. It, it does happen sometimes, <laughs> but uh, you know, like you know, we it's just like you know, um, lucky or, or unlucky, right? It's just like you know, we we get ripped off in Bangkok. It's just it's like that. It's just like because you're a tourist, so. It, it's meant to happen. It's more just you're uh, a tourist. Yeah, exactly. It's more like that. It's not like oh, because you're from the south, so I'm gonna rip you off. But uh, it, it does happen. Yeah. And um, maybe because of the the like one 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 bad vendor did it, and then they they think it 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 works. Then they can tell the other vendor, yeah, and then yeah. they keep doing it in the chain. So it becomes like. A coach in Hanoi to like rip off people, maybe. Yeah. But I think that, that there was a lot of that in the past, not anymore, to my right. knowledge. Yeah. Right. So, have you faced any discrimination in Saigon for being from the north? Actually, no. Uh, lucky for me, but um, I don't think that would be a lot of discrimination here in the south in terms of that. But uh, in, in daily life, I mean, in person. But on the internet, you know, like there would be really bad comments, really rude people, uh, you know, talking nasty things about, you know, people from other regions. Yeah. So you're saying it happens online, but not. In it happens person. online more than in in person. Well, that's pretty common, right? Because people love to talk shit online, and then uh, <laughs> they don't really they don't really mean it in real life, right? So yeah. what um. Tell me just briefly then, so you've moved, tell me about growing up in Hanoi then before moving to Japan. That's incredible, like 18 years old moving to Japan. How did that happen? Um, I think it's kind of like a common thing for, for people who's 18 and then about to graduate high school to do in, in, in Vietnam in general. Um, I was um, studying in a school and in a, um, an English specialized class. So if you're in that class, you're, 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 you're meant to be going somewhere after high school. And at that point, my, my school was kind of like 50, 50, 50 would be going, like wanting to go to the U S and the rest would be wanting to go somewhere else that, you know, like overseas to study. Um, I chose Singapore at that point. Um, but then unfortunately I failed the entrance test to oh. yeah to the universities there so i had no choice but um enrolling in a uh, uni in hanoi which is uh, hanoi university at that point um and then i had one semester there um and then i found this uh, university in japan in the southern island uh one of my friends in my class already went there and she was like, oh, it's absolutely amazing. You're going to love it. Uh, why don't you apply? So I listened to her. I applied. I got the scholarship and I went. That's awesome. And so how is your Japanese? Uh, at that time, like zero, zero percentage. Like um, we, uh, that's, that's like a um, global, not global, uh, international university. So they also have like uh you know foreigners and they have 50 percent uh japanese for foreigners who don't have any um japanese skill language skill then we would have to enroll in a english-based uh like uh syllabus and then at the at the same time we would have to take uh japanese classes to uh to help with our daily life and then for the first two years we we had to study the uh, Japanese language from beginner level to um, advanced. So you studied in English? And study uh, Japanese at the same time. Right, right. Ah, interesting. So whereabouts did you travel in Japan? That was one of the last countries that we went to um, before the lockdown, before the before the pandemic. was so glad. It was like a last minute, <laughs> almost like a weekend trip away to Kyoto and Osaka. And thank goodness we did, because you know, haven't left Vietnam now in, in two years. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I had lived there for twelve years, so I um, I did get um, you know to travel quite a lot in in Japan. So all the you know big cities and uh, big destinations that that everyone has to uh, visit, then I I had visited there, and I ended up uh, in Tokyo my later years, and then I just came back from Tokyo two years ago. 
Yes, yeah, so you've just come back recently to Vietnam. While yeah. while you were in um, Japan, so you obviously you studied interior design and business. You worked for companies like IKEA. That's pretty cool. So it's, uh, you designed furniture for IKEA. Well, my uh, my career path, uh, my my life story is quite uh, like unusual because it doesn't go like one straight line like this. It's kind of like zigzaggy. Um, so I study business in the beginning because uh, as any many other Asian parents, they wouldn't let their children study art, right? <laughs> For to them, it's art. Yeah, we've heard, we've heard uh, this before on the show and, and personally <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah. So they were like, art doesn't make any money. Art is not gonna help you get rich. Uh, <laughs> go study something like you know, like business. So I went to study business, <laughs> oh. right? And then uh, my third year, when I was still studying business, and then I had one more year until graduation, and I was like, no, I cannot picture myself wearing suits in a cubicle, working in business finance to say uh, then i was like mom dad like i i know you didn't say yes before but i'm my th i'm in my third year now i know what i'm doing with my life uh i'm doing fine until now can i go study design <laughs> and then i think at that point um because because of what i said and they they know that i can do you know live on my own so they said yes and um, I was like, okay, now I can, I actually, I, I know how to do graphic design now. So I, maybe I should study something that, um, that I don't know. So I, uh, I had interest in interior for all my life. So uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to find a school that has an uh, interior design course. And then I found one in Tokyo <laughs> and I went there and, I, and, and it, yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> uh, graduating there and I got a job at IKEA Japan um, so I was uh, one of the designers that you know designs the, the sample rooms if you ever been to IKEA you know yeah, like, they yeah. have one floor with just like rooms and rooms of you know yeah. different lifestyle <laughs> which one was that crumpet or butter uh, both of them <laughs> <laughs> if one goes to this does the other one go exactly. as well yeah <laughs> Yeah, so um, IKEA was a really nice experience for me to like, you know, uh, my, my first step into the working environment in, in Japan, learned a lot, um, you know, culture shock as well. Um, and then after being there for three years, I felt like I had learned everything that I did. And then there was uh, every year was kind of the same work. So I was like, okay, I... Um, I was not actively looking for a different job, but I had that thought. Hmm. Yeah. And then um, I was like, okay, if something cool, interesting comes up, then I will be doing that. Um, and it's just like my, my career path is quite a, um, a series of uh, lucky events. So <laughs> uh, when I was having that thought and one of my friends who, just got a job at the uh, Trunk Hotel, which is um, Tokyo's first five-star boutique hotel at that time, uh, 2017. Uh, she got a job there as a barista, and then she was like, now you, you're saying that you, you kind of want to change job. Like, do you want me to like, pass on your uh, CV to a Trunk Hotel? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Um, at that time, like, Trunk Hotel doesn't have any position that I think I would be interested in. And then, but they, um, they decided to have a talk with me. And then during the first talk, they also, we both sat down and they were like, okay, I don't know what you can do. And we also don't know what we can give you. On my side, I also like, okay, I don't know what I can <laughs> do for you guys. And, but uh, we can talk this through. And um, if we can find something in common, then we can, you know, develop, uh, develop from there. And then we were just chatting, uh, like doesn't really go anywhere. Then they asked me, do you do social media? And I was like, duh. And then yeah. I was like, oh, well, I do do this um, account for my dogs, Crumpet and Butter. And then at that point, I think I had about 100,000 followers or something. Wow. So they saw that and they were like, okay, you know what you're doing. <laughs> so, 
yeah and then they were like okay we don't actually have any position for social media um specialists but uh because we also the first boutique hotel in tokyo we want to uh become a benchmark for you know other hotels that come after to be like one of those uh hotels who really care about the visual and uh you know like um, the brand images and stuff can you come and help us with the social media and stuff i was like yeah that is amazing well i love as well how you said you didn't monetize the like the crumpet and butter instagram but you got a career and a job out of it so that's amazing yes i can say like i monetize a little bit out of it right <laughs> <laughs> well I, i had an important question first of all though about ikea was how many swedish meatballs did you eat oh my god unlimited like i can't <laughs> Oh, I, mean, I mean, if I get one dollar for every bowl that I ate, that sounds really wrong <laughs> out of my mouth now. But I would be, I would be rich now, and I do miss it a lot. Like I don't know when I can actually coming here, but I that will be the first thing I'm gonna eat. So just make it clear, you miss putting Swedish meatballs in your mouth. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> But you did mention something else there about IKEA, um, and but it probably ca- carries on to your career at Trunk as well. One question I wanted to ask about: you know, Japan is very famous for its work culture, or or maybe more appropriate is infamous for its work work culture. Um, and for me, it makes me really sad because you know I, I really value work life balance, and when you When you hear these kind of not rumors, when you see these things, you hear about them on TV. The pressure that that, that there is in the in the workplace in Korea, it yeah, it makes me feel really sad because I don't think anyone should have to have to live like that. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> and I wonder, well, how was that for you? Like you must have experienced that firsthand. Then is it? Do you just get used to it? Is it manageable, or is it a horrible stress and pressure the whole time? Um, but to be completely honest, I actually uh, we're on the same page because I I even though I was living in Japan, but I never really had um, any experience in uh, experiencing that uh, you know horrible work life balance because IKEA was also uh, international like they are Swedish company so they follow their um, international guidelines in terms of work life balance so I I had to like finish on time I I got yelled at. One time, because I was staying after 5 p.m., trying to finish my work, and so that was like really, you know, uh, like really nice first mm-hmm. step for me to ease into the working environment in Japan. And then I never really um, like experienced how horrible like work life balance in in Japan was. And then moving to Trunk Hotel, they were also like because they're in. Uh, uh, Hospitality industry, and they want to become one of those, you know, international global uh, image. So they also um, do not really encourage people overworking. Mm. And uh, my role was like kind of like marketing and social media uh, management. So I kind of had a lot of freedom to on my end. Uh, like I can even go to work at 1 p.m., go home at 5 p.m. It doesn't matter. As long as I deliver what I need to deliver, mm. so also very lucky of me. So I never really experienced the Japanese corporate life. Yeah, yeah. I think that is really lucky. What? So what? What was your experience of that culture? Like even from afar. So luckily you didn't experience it. But what? How did that eventuate in reality or friends that you had? Because I think of things I've read or seen about, like you know, businessmen have to stay out drinking all night just to impress their peers or their boss and. I think I've seen pictures of businessmen in suits sleeping on the sidewalk, then going to work the next morning. I mean, is that like, am I just seeing a couple of things on Reddit that's been blown out of proportion or is that a reality in Japan? That's actually reality. Like, uh, even though I'm not in that environment, but I, I see it happening every day. So I'm kind of like in that uh, environment If you know what I mean, mm-hmm. uh, just like oh you know, God. every like you know, every time on the train there would be at least five drunk salary men, and you know, like they would be like looking horrible, like really hating their life. Uh, friends, like my friends who work for uh, Japanese corporates, they they actually feel stressed about drinking parties, like they don't want to do it, but they have to do it for their career, yeah, for their relationships, yeah. 
So how do you call them salary men? Is that what you call them? That's what people call them in, in Japan, salary yeah. men. Yeah. So how, this was a kind of question I thought about before. So how do those people form relationships, like, you know, partnerships? How do they, is that part of impressing a partner that you can do all of that? How do they have time if they have children? Like, I, I just don't understand. It just it seems to me such an unsustainable lifestyle. So how does it, is it, like, how does it work basically? <laughs> I mean, sadly, like major, like um, a majority of them actually don't have any relationship. Like mm -hmm. they, they, they work. Uh, the re only relationship that they have is with their boss. Like you know what I mean. Like they, they go to work, they come home. They go to work, they come home. Basically, that's that's their life. So they don't really have any time to like even have uh, the fun for themselves. Mm -hmm. Let alone you know finding a a, a partner. So is there a point, like, do they do that just until a certain age? Is that something you do in your 20s as a young executive or, or young professional? At what point do you then, because you can't do that forever, right? So at what point do they move out of that? Is that something you just have to go through to get ahead? At what point do you get ahead? Um, well, um, I think early 20s, when you just graduate, then you would have properly have to do it. And if you have a, uh, a more open-minded uh, mindset, then you will, at one, some point, maybe from 25 uh, um, onwards, you would find that uh, lifestyle not healthy and mm. you actually want to change it. And, you know, you start to uh, develop friendships, uh, go out more, uh, not staying up late uh, at work. Mm. Then um, I would say from 25, if, people who have open-minded mindset they will they will find a way to change their lifestyle other than that they will just stick to that you know non-work life balance uh existence um for the rest of their life that's just wow. how sad the uh the industry in japan is yeah so um i would recommend going to japan for fun for yeah. traveling <laughs> <laughs> living there is not as fun like to be honest well this is this is kind of why i'm asking because you know being a, an english teacher as well myself i would never want to work in japan although i've had some friends who have enjoyed it there and and they do enjoy it but similar with korea and japan that this is the reason why many english teachers don't enjoy working there and, and they love vietnam because there's definitely much more of a, a focus on the work-life balance but to go back to ikea it's quite funny that um last week when we hosted a quiz one of one of the rounds was 12 different types of tables and you had to write down which type of table it was so i'm gonna send you the quiz round after after we finished and you have to send me the answers by your face right now it looks like you don't even know 12 different types of table no you mean like the names of the products or not like so this was one of the questions at the quiz was like do you mean like the ikea names of it and i was like no no not the just like the type of table like in terms of shape and functions and stuff. yeah so for example one of them would be dining table dining room table oh, would okay be, would be one example okay. um but how many types of tables do you think that you could name if you were at this quiz you would have got full marks i hope Ooh, I hope so too, because otherwise it's going to be so embarrassing. <laughs> I'm going to send, I'm going to send it to you afterwards, and then uh, I'll. Oh, yeah, I, I would love to give it a try. Yes. I'll, uh, at the end of the podcast, keep listening. I'll record how Ben did, what his score was on the table. <laughs> you probably need to edit it out, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, so you obviously, so you're a, a creative person, obviously, and it's amazing. It's good. It's it's so funny. When you say about your parents wanted you to do business, it's one of these things because most stereotypes are based in reality. Um, you know, Scottish people have a reputation for being alcoholics. Well, not all alcoholics, but statistically, we have a massive problem with alcohol in Scotland. So there, there is this, a truth to the stereotype. Um, that, that stereotype of the tiger parents, of Asian parents, really only wanting their kids to, to do you know, accountant, doctor, lawyer, engineer. It's just so true, isn't it? Yes. Um, I think it's also because uh, due to the lack of uh, media exposure for that generation. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, we are still like developing countries. So, you know, when, sure. you know, at that 
with that generation, they actually did not have any exposure to the social media, right? They, uh, we didn't even have that much of like TV content as you guys would in, in the Western uh, countries. But um, so it's just like for them, art and design in general, it's just like, you know, like drawing and painting. Yeah, yeah, for I sure. I think that's what they think of art. Uh, and so because of that, they were like, how can you like make money off, you know, just like drawing? Yeah, uh, it's not gonna you know take you anywhere. Just do something that like people actually need you for, like business, finance, doctor, uh, you know those uh, titles. So I think it's just it's it's common. Like we we don't even take it uh, personal personally anymore. Like it it just you know one of the Asian cultures that yeah. that parents would be uh, you know tiger parents who don't allow their kids to you know explore the world and do what they want. Do you think that's changing for the next generation of students? Absolutely. Like with, with the social media so developing right now, um, they get exposed to more things happening in the world. They they get to know more about, like, uh, say, NFTs. Like, who thought of NFTs, right? So now they know that, you know, artists can actually make a lot of money off, you know, one of their paintings, uh, you know, one of their uh, cartoon characters. Yeah. Uh, so it's just like the more exposure that they get to uh, to experience, then uh, it will be better for the next generation. It it will be less of uh, pressure for them to to have to follow what their parents want them to follow. Mm. In my op- opinion, yeah. Well, you've brought us to our next point perfectly. NFTs. Okay, so you are a NFT creator. Is that correct? Is that how I would put it? Um, to be honest, I still at this point I still don't one hundred percent understand NFT and how <laughs> how can I make money off it? I do have it though. Uh, but uh, if you're interested and if you're interested in buying, then <laughs> you're more than welcome to. Um, I will link it to you. But uh, yeah, I'm still also like uh seeing what other artists do, uh, how the market is like actually changing, and how, what people would be interested in buying as uh, NFT art. So let's let's go back a step before we're buying an NFT. Let's figure out what the hell is it? Because I'm looking at it now. It's just like blowing up. It's, it's just all over the place. All I hear is about NFTs. And look, a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> I'm so unknowledgeable about it. I saw something about it. You know, it's a non-fungible token. I'm not going to lie. I thought it was a made up word. I thought fungible was a joke word. I thought it maybe had something to do with fungus. I just thought the whole thing was a joke, like a non-fungible token. And then I started reading about it and Googling and I'm like, oh, fungible is a word. And then there's another word called non-fungible. So do you want to explain the difference between fungible and non-fungible before I butcher it, if you know? I actually don't. <laughs> <laughs> so you, I can actually share what you researched so far and let me know. <laughs> okay, so fungible is something that can be exchanged. Hold on, let me just quickly Google it again. Just quickly remind myself, fungible. So basically it was saying when I looked up, it's something like Bitcoin to your eight limits. So Google says able to replace or be replaced by another identical item mutually interchangeable all right whereas non-fungible means that it can't be replaced by another item so what an nft is this is where it blows my mind right so you create a digital artwork right yes and it and for some reason it's called an nft the nft part of it is you sell it to somebody right and they own the original now because it's digital they own the original digital copy so that's theirs. But the problem is, well, not the problem, but the thing is because it's a digital thing, anyone can copy and paste it. So it can be copy and pasted a million times. But that person still owns the original. And what it was compared to, which I thought was a really good comparison, was it's like owning the original of the Mona Lisa. You own the original Mona Lisa. There's still a million copies. There's a million tea towels with the Mona Lisa on it but you own the original. But the problem is the Mona Lisa is a physical thing. You own it, you have it. Obviously, it's in a museum, but it's just as an example. Whereas an NFT is a a digital thing. Nobody can tell the difference between the original digital artwork that you've created and the copy of it. And so I don't understand 
I don't know if anyone understands. I'm sure someone does. I don't understand how it has value. And why is it blowing up right now? Why is that all I see on the news, all I hear about is NFTs, NFTs? Can you explain any more on what I've just described? Well, um, I actually don't know when or where it started with this whole new trend. Uh, but you were absolutely right with the Mona Lisa. I actually read that uh, Reddit <laughs> thread about Mona Lisa. It's like explaining really sim uh, in a simple way how NFT works. Is that you know like you 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 can uh, you if you own the uh, original, then no matter how many copies that other people have, it it doesn't it it doesn't have any value. So for NFT, it's a, it's the same. Say I have this uh, picture of uh, biscuits that I drew uh, digitally, then you buy it from me as an NFT, uh, and then you own it. So now even if I send that uh, you know uh, JPEG uh, version of biscuit photo to 20 other people and then later on if that uh, if biscuit became famous and uh the value of the drawing that i made that i sold to you would be worth you know millions of dollars and um those 20 other uh, other 20 people that they have the copy of uh, biscuit they want to sell it to try to you know like get some money off it they cannot because they they don't have any um say when you buy the nft for me you will get a specific code to it and that would right. be your kind of like my um autocraft like my real yeah. that this is the uh, only original. one original artwork then no one can actually sell it off um, to get money so then would it come down to like you know trademarking or copyright or whatnot so if someone else made tea towels for example or was selling posters with this picture on it you could be like, hey, I didn't uh, give you permission to copy this because I own this picture. Like, is, I don't know the legalities of it. Is that what it is? Absolutely, yeah. You can have the right to, to sue them and bring them to court for uh, violating. I feel like there's going to be a huge problem in Vietnam where uh, everyone copies everything. <laughs> <laughs> but then in a sad way, do we actually care? <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, yeah, true. So oh. the other question I had for you as well, because I saw on your website, it said all your works are digitally hand drawn. Now that seems like a massive oxymoron to me. How can it be digitally hand drawn? Uh, my digital drawing, uh, let's say Korea, um, started out, I've always uh, loved drawing. Uh, uh, but uh, because of that, I cannot just like bring paper and pens and, you know, like spread out like a whole uh, desk of my, uh, uh, my stationery on the plane to draw. So then I was like, okay, I want to draw when, uh, wherever I go, um, like anytime I want. And then at that point, uh, Apple just released the first uh, iPad Pro that comes with a pen. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna switch to that so I can, you know, like draw more because because of all the troublesome that I have to do with the traditional um, stationery, then I I get lazy and I didn't really draw as much as I wanted. Um, so because of the iPad Pro, I actually began to draw more and more and more, and then I got better at it. Yeah. And then now I'm just like, yeah, I don't know how to draw on the paper anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm such an old man. I'm so old. I mean, all of this technology has been invented in my lifetime. That's why I feel like I'm an old man just asking this stupid question. How did you digitally hand draw it? And you're like, well, yeah, because I just used an iPad Pro. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I just can't even fathom in my mind like how you digitally create that. But I guess it's not that crazy, right? The other question I had about NFTs is, do they have to have the same kind of style because every nft i've seen so far and even looking at yours they've all got the same kind of style is that part of it or is that just coincidence? not at all you can actually sell anything as an nft like it's like uh you know like one of the most expensive nft artworks uh that just got so recently was um, a series of photos that a guy uh had been taking for five years non-stop and then they he put it into a collage and then he sold it and now it's like i don't know how much like 65 million dollars so it's like you can actually sell anything as nft you can actually sell this podcast 
as an NFT and uh, let's split if someone buys it. Yes. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I have no idea. See, this is where I get, I'm just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. How do you sell this podcast as an NFT? Well, I don't get it. Like also the, the whole thing, like even with cryptocurrency, I don't fully understand how it has value, right? Other than we just assign it value. So even with the NFT, so he sold this for 65 million just because someone's like, I want to pay 65 million for it. Or it's like, is it because... So if you create an NFT, it's just because it's a work of art. Someone's like, oh my God, that is so amazing. I will pay you X amount of money. To all, to my understanding now, it's I think it's just like a, a, a piece of art that someone's really interested in owning and they have so much money on hands and then they just want to buy it. Uh, mm. that, that's to my ex, um, understanding now. Like I I don't know the, the back of the mind of the person that purchased it. Yeah. Uh, so I can't really tell like what actually, you know, initiated the, the idea of buying the, that, uh, you know, uh, say uh, collage of, of selfies, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the other thing, because people keep talking about it being kind of like a speculative market or people are investing in it. So what is it that suddenly people think that they, they put all this money into it and then it's going to increase in value? I don't understand. Anyway, we're going in circles. I'm never going to, I'll understand it one day. Don't I, worry. Yeah. Now, what we're going to do, thank you very much for joining me. This is the first episode of season eight of uh, 7 Million Bikes. I'm so excited. Well, it's now 7 Million Bikes, a Vietnam podcast, which has changed from a Saigon podcast. We're listened to all over the world. We've already hit over 27,000 downloads. We're rated as one of the top 10% podcasts in the world. So it's pretty awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much to everyone that's listening. We're going to finish as we do with every single episode with a series of questions and I change them for every single season. So this is the first question of season eight and the first interview with Ben Nguyen. If you could travel anywhere in Vietnam for a week, where would you go and why? Um, for one, I would say Dalat though, because everyone's been to Dalat, to be honest. Like I'm the only Vietnamese person or like just the only person in Vietnam who hasn't been to Dala. And Wait, it's, what? It's, You've never been to Dala? Exactly. It's embarrassing, right? Because of that reaction <laughs> that you just gave me right now, it's just like, okay, I might as well just go now. So just don't stop judging me. <laughs> but Biscuit's been you... to Dala twice? She has a better life than me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, that's a good reason. But I think you are, you... you are literally the last person in Vietnam to not exactly go to but when you say seven days i i don't know i don't know if i can actually do seven days in dalat like i've never been but i feel like it's too small to be there for seven days but i would just go to dalat for now now that would be my answer it. Yes. some cool air it'd be awesome so tourism is coming back to vietnam soon what advice would you give to a tourist coming to vietnam for the first time uh, um bringing lots of cash <laughs> <laughs> like physical cash or like have yeah. lots of money no i feel like because uh let's just say like uh you're coming here after after this whole um you know situation uh that we just had for the past two years then you probably are over excited about anything that you will be doing here anyway so you probably want to do everything and eat everything <laughs> and drink everything and buy everything so it's just bring lots of cash in i like it what you're you know, saying like... is stimulate the economy <laughs> yes yeah that is good advice actually if you're a tourist and you're coming to vietnam please stimulate the tourism economy that is a great one because honestly, yeah. like, there's so many new things popping up and it's just like, even we living here every day, uh, it's like, it's, it's hard to like catch up with everything new opening up, right? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. It's been like that since the day we arrived six years ago, just something new all the time opening up. It's uh, but that's what makes it exciting, right? Exactly. So what advice would you give to someone thinking about moving to Vietnam to live? Um, I would say... If you if you actually want to come and wish to come and you if you're actually coming then come with an um, open-minded mindset uh, because you know ev anywhere you go in the world there would be pros and cons and there would be like things that's different from your where you're from so don't look at one thing uh, with one side like be be you know like um, generous about uh, any um, say 
hard situation that you're going to be in, like look from both sides and treat it with um, open mind. Great advice. And to anyone who's been living here for a long time, that's great advice as well. Um, now, this is a question that's come up, um, comes up time and time again, even before I lived in Vietnam. What do you think, what do you think is the difference between an expat and an immigrant? Um, am I an immigrant? Because I, I feel like I'm an expat here. Like, because I, I was born and raised in Hanoi. Uh, I left when I was 18. I came back after 12 years overseas. So basically, I'm a, uh, do you know the term VK, Viet Kiều? Mm -hmm. uh like overseas vietnamese right so i think i'm also one of those terms that you just just asked me so i think i'm a immigrant like who 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 comes and live here and expat is who comes and work here <laughs> does it make any sense no so uh i didn't want to give my opinion away on the first episode but but you've you've completely said what i agree is really simple uh, an expat comes to work and an immigrant comes to live and lots of people get like you know love to virtue signal and be like oh why do we call them expats when they're actually immigrants like i don't consider myself an immigrant because i i don't know how long i'll be in vietnam i didn't come here with the intention to live here i came here with the intention to work so it doesn't really matter which country you're in what race you are where you're from if you move to a country to live there you're an immigrant if you move there to work you're an expat it's not to say that you might become an immigrant if you live there long enough and you decide to spend your life there but to me that's the main difference but what i'm interested to hear what our other guests have to say on that as well and I then think last they question. just share the same like a, a common ground at some like in some areas so it's like really hard to like really say this person is an expat and this person is um an immigrant because you might be thinking that you're an immigrant but then something might happen and you wanted to go somewhere else right and then you then you will become an expat all those yeah, years yeah. that you thought you were an immigrant so it's it's crazy on. <laughs> yeah that's true it can go backwards as well yeah that's exactly true <laughs> now final question and of all eight seasons this might be one of my favorite questions i've ever thought of if vietnam was a person how would you describe them it would definitely be a she and um she would have so many hidden charms and the more that you get to know her the more you like her and she's Aww. spicy as well <laughs> well she's only spicy in the middle of the country right yes <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes say something that we don't even understand <laughs> <laughs> well listen ben thank you so so much for joining me for being the first guest on season eight um as i said to ben before we started this recording um so ben is also a uh, a boxing trainer as well he's a fitness fanatic and he's been doing online fitness courses all through the pandemic which has kept adri um sane fit and healthy um i don't participate i sit in the background on the computer listening and all i heard throughout the whole lockdown was ben's voice going jab cross jab jab cross jab cross i like it sometimes i fall asleep at night just still hearing ben's voice in my head even though you you have never really done it but you got the rhythm though like just 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 from what you just said now like you're on beats <laughs> that's because i heard it so many times but it was awesome so ben before you go please tell people listening where can they follow you where can they buy your nft we're going to put links in the description so if anyone wants to find them they can go into the show notes click the link follow ben um tell the people where they can find you uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me for, I don't know, I was the first guest to be on your uh, eighth season. Like, congratulations. Like, you've thank you done much. an amazing job. Um, and uh, if you want, would like to get to know more about me, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, it's um, at it's Ben Nguyen. And you can, every, all the links I have is on there. So you can find my NFTs there. You can follow my uh, uh our daughters there you can follow my app there uh just my life in general there as well so um i hope to see some of you there if you ever find me <laughs> awesome yep we'll make sure to check it out at it's ben win and we didn't even get a chance to talk about you are a very talented photographer as well aren't you uh, I, 
I do all right. <laughs> You've been you modest. I've been I've been told that you are a very very talented photographer, and we didn't even get into that. So yeah, definitely check out um, at it's Ben Win and Ben. Thank you so much. I will thank hopefully you so see you crumpet butter and Mitch soon. Yeah, thank you. I hope to see you soon, very soon. Thank you. Cheers. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. Cheers. Cheers. Bye bye.